Well, hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and uh, we are doing our virtual star party for July 22, 2012. So tonight we've got uh, three live telescopes right now with another live telescope coming pretty, sh pretty soon, as soon as it gets dark. So uh, first I'm going to start with Gary Ganella, who is in Los Angeles. And we've got John Kramer. John, you're in Tennessee. No. Where are Tennessee. you, John? You're in Tennessee. Yep. I got it. All right. Whew. Got it. Um, good. And then we've got uh, Teal Bristra, who is down, down under in Australia. I promise to never fake an Australian accent again. Um, <laughs> is in, uh, you're in um, you're Brisbane. Perth, right? Oh, you're in Brisbane. Right. They're right beside each other, aren't they? No. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, that's, in Brisbane. That's, like <laughs> that's about right, yeah. So distance between Vancouver and Toronto. Um, and then we've got Stuart Foreman, who's down in San Francisco. And as you can see, it's great. You can see I've got a great view there of uh, Stuart's night sky. You can see his telescope set up. You can see the, the, just the faint blue sky now. So it's almost dark, in it, dark enough for him to start pulling in some, some objects for us. I'm just focusing and centering now. Perfect. Um, so we thought we would just get started, and then Stuart can come online once it gets dark enough for, for him. Now, joining us for color commentary, we've got uh, Ray Sanders, who's in Sanders, also known as Dear Astronomer. He's in uh, uh, Arizona. And we've got Scott Lewis. Uh, what, what, are you, what are you going by now, Scott? Are you the bald astronomer? I am the bald astronomer. Bald astronomer, okay. Um, and uh, you're located in the Los Angeles area. And I am uh, on Vancouver Island in Canada. So what we do, if you've never seen this before, is uh, we hook up a bunch of live uh, telescopes into this hangout, and we'll just switch from object to object. We'll take requests. We'll answer questions about gear, about technique, about uh, the very nature of, uh, of the cosmos. So feel free to ask any questions. There's a few places you can ask questions. You can ask questions. Um, if you're watching this live on YouTube, you can uh, make a comment or question there. Uh, if you're watching this live on the Google Plus page, there's the one that ends in uh, uh, 7LZ6. If you look up at your URL and you can see that, then that's the one that we're doing right now. Uh, you can also, I'm also tracking the events page, so if you're watching this on the event that's publicizing the Hangout, then, uh, then we'll be catching the questions there. Or if you're watching this on CosmoQuest or any other place where the, it's embedded, you can always use the, uh, the hashtag StarParty on Twitter, and we will catch it there as well. So those are all the places, and we're glad to answer any questions. Uh, for example, Paul just asked, uh, who's in Brisbane? And that's Teal Brister, the one with the, with the sun. So, so uh, this is where it shows you that we're actually in a spherical world, and uh, and Teal is in uh, is it's daytime for for him down in uh, in Brisbane. So that's really cool. Um, so Gary's in Los Angeles. So this is Gary's view right now. Uh, John's in Tennessee, so he's in sort of closer to Eastern time, and Stuart is also on the west coast of of North America. So, and Teal's in uh, is in Australia. And unfortunately, we had a bunch of other people queued up, and just terrible weather as usual. Um, We've had one person, unfortunately, who's wanted to be here like four weeks in a row in uh, Malaysia, and he's just gotten clouded out every single time. It's just, uh, it's been awful. I can't wait for you to see his telescope. And the Shaw, we'll make it up to you. We will yeah. do some sort of no cloud dance and <laughs> get it all dance. taken care of. Yeah, well, it, it, astronomers have this thing, right, that uh, it's whenever you buy new gear, that's what, that's what summons the clouds. So, so somebody has clearly bought some new gear. Um, but uh, cool. So why don't we get started then? So uh, we'll start with what uh, with what Gary's got. Gary, what have you got? I have helps by unmute myself. Some dogs are barking. Uh, I've moved down a little bit, and this should be the Cygnus bubble. Uh, right up here is the end of the crescent that we just looked at, and right down here again, it's one that I haven't looked at before. Let me make sure I got the full sixty second. Supposed to be a Cygnus bubble. I think it's right here. Is that the soap bubble nebula uh, that you're referring I to? I don't think it's a soap bubble. It's called the Cygnus bubble, and it may be out of range of my stuff. Yeah, as I say, I'm not familiar with Cygnus either. I'm familiar with soap bubble, but I'm not familiar yeah. with Cygnus. Yeah, it it is a soap bubble nebula, and actually, I know the guy that discovered that, and it's kind of crazy. He's what? an amateur. He's an amateur astronomer. He well. I guess as amateur as you can get. He's a superintendent of the Mount Wilson Observatory, uh, Dave Drosovich. And this 
Awesome guy. Um, I had a link to his telescope. He's got a 160 millimeter refractor. He's using the the observatory dome that Edwin Hubble originally used when he first got to Mount Wilson. It's a smaller dome. It's what he first you know cut his teeth on, and this is what he used, I believe, in 2008 to discover this nebula, and was independently verified 11 days later. He also said that if you ever discover anything. You know, as an amateur astronomer, and you want to have it recognized, don't. <laughs> it's that it's that much trouble. It took him three, you know, around three years to have everything finalized. A lot of red tape, but yeah, it's it's really beautiful. Uh, if we can pull it out, if not, I have some images of it. I think well, it's right in here. Yeah, I've got one that I'm pulling up real quick. Well, there's a different, it's interesting, there's a different procedure for all the different kinds of objects, and so if you discover, like, a new nebula, I'm pretty sure you get to name them. So, like, isn't there, like, there, we talked about this last week, right, that there was one that you can, that was named after, after someone that's fairly new. While, for example, asteroids, um, the person who discovers the asteroid gets to propose names, and they're voted on by the International Astronomical Union. In fact, I have an asteroid named after me, which is kind of cool. So, um, there was a, there was a guy, I got to brag, yeah, yeah. No, um, uh, there was a, um, there was an astronomer a couple of a couple of years ago who uh, he actually passed away, but he actually discovered a um, a whole bunch of of asteroids and named them after after people. So there's one after Phil Plate, and I think there's one named after Pendulet and um, Dawkins. There's a whole bunch of them. Jeff, uh, um, oh man, the blue collar astronomer, Jeff Marcy. Oh, Foxworthy. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> astronomer. astronomer. Astronomer, yeah, yeah. Oh, might be astronomer if. Yeah, you might be astronomer if. Yeah. So, um, there you go, there's the soap bubble. So, Oh, and I want to give a special shout out to Star Talk, uh, which is uh, watching us right now. And actually should, should come over on the other side. If anyone who doesn't know, Star Talk is, uh, is the podcast that's done with uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. So they're actually working on doing some some hangouts on air and starting to try and move towards broadcasting. So uh, Star Talk folks, if you want, you're more than welcome to join us on, on this side of the hangout at some point, um, especially if you happen to actually be Neil deGrasse Tyson. But I think it's just the producers uh, behind the show. But that would be awesome. Just the uh, producers, really? Just merely the producers, yeah. <laughs> producers are very valuable. So anyway, let's talk more space. Um, Cool. Uh, well, that's fantastic. So oh, I brought up here. Oh, that's great, right? So that's what it's that's what it's supposed to look like. Uh, <laughs> sort of, depending on what telescope you use. Uh, like Scott was saying, you know, this this was to, discovered by uh, Dave Drasovich, who I've had the pleasure of meeting as well at my astronomy workshop at Mount Wilson. Um, this is a planetary nebula, like what we've talked about in previous um, hangouts, where you know we have a sun-like star that gets to the end of its life cycle and starts puffing out its outer layers and blowing out a basically a shell of, of hot gas and somewhere in there is probably a small little white dwarf just cooling away for a few trillion years. That's amazing. Yeah, I think it's right in here but yeah. also with the hydrogen alpha filter and I'm looking at yours, there's a lot of blue in there, so I might be blocking the whole thing out in hydrogen alpha. Yeah. I could also switch to a different, um, I'd, I'd have to double check on which, um, actually I don't think that this image provides any information as to what filters it's using. I can try and find another one and uh, in different wavelengths, but um, I think they're all going to be very yeah, similar I'm to this one, where we're going to see a glowing bubble which is yeah, why it's not so I'm not going to pull it out any better than what is right now. So let's move on. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and, and move to something else, and then uh, we'll keep looking at things. I want to go over to the sun, and there's actually a really interesting story going on with the sun today. So this is a live view of the sun, but I think what's really funny here is there's nothing on it. In the, like last week, the sun had one of the largest sunspot clusters on the surface of it, and this week... It, it's almost completely empty. Teal, how, you're looking at it directly. What are you seeing there? Yeah, look at the moment. I can only see the, the two sunspot groups. So there's this little one here. Uh, I don't know how it's coming through on the hangar, but it's only a really tiny one. 
And then there's one more out over on the right-hand side limb here. So over the next few days, if I can find it. Oh, there it is. So right, I don't know if you can see that just on the limb there. So over the next few days, that one should come around and face us a little bit better. That's, uh, so yeah, I'm is, shooting is, for the, the most boring views on a virtual star party ever today, actually. <laughs> that is the most boring sun I think we've ever seen, which is really weird because right now the sun is at its um, is is closing towards the peak of its uh, of its activity level, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah so I think it's just coming up here. 2014. 2014, yeah. So we're near. We're going towards the maximum, and, and we're seeing a lot more activity. We're seeing some of the largest. Uh, um, sort of most active sunspots, lots of flares, lots of aurora activity. And in fact, last week I put out this big warning to everybody, which is that if you live anywhere kind of north, you can head outside and at night go up and, and look to the north and you might see auroras. So and a lot of people did. There's some amazing pictures. I saw aurora pictures from people as far south as um, I saw Oregon, um, the Great Lakes region. So it was a really good, good time for auroras last week, people in England. Now, have any of you seen auroras live? I have, because I live Meat in Canada, space. right? Yes. yes. Well, yeah. Don't you get them every night, Fraser? That's every like night, you know, yeah. go out on go out yeah. on your porch and watch the northern lights. <laughs> we're we're at the very southern border of of Canada, so so we don't see very many. But uh, you know, you do, and and I mean, part of auroras is it takes a lot of patience, right? You've got to go stand outside in pretty dark skies and just watch for a really long time. Um, and be, and be patient, and kids aren't patient, so uh, <laughs> that's the problem that we have. But, um, uh, yeah, so Paul is just mentioning uh, that they had aurora activity in Perth, and that's and we were showing some video of that last week. There's also some amazing auroras seen in, uh, in New Zealand. So whenever you get an aurora, you get it both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and as, as far south as sometimes the middle of the United States, and as far north, from the you know from the southern hemisphere is Australia, New Zealand, places like that. Um, I see it live once. Well, I grew up in Michigan, and I got to see them once when I was a child, and it was awesome. It was absolutely amazing, especially in, in the Detroit area where there's just light pollution like you wouldn't believe. But yeah, it was it was amazing getting to see them on the far horizon. Scott Reed wants to know any visibility of the moon tonight. Uh, no, the moon is like close to a new moon right now, and it would be visible in the morning. So um, we're still probably, next week I'll bet you we'll get a nice sliver of the moon next week. Unfortunately, the timing's really bad. I mean, if this is the first ones you've seen, all through the winter and all through the spring, we had the most amazing views of the planets. We had, um, we had beautiful views of Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, and, and even last week we had Pluto. Um, but uh, now you've got Saturn up for you, don't you, Stuart? You should be able to um, get Saturn. Uh, no, I got a tree and a cloud in the way. <laughs> tree and a cloud, okay. So this might be another planetless... Uh, well, I guess we had two Saturns last week, so, but this might be a planetless week. So. Here you but go, if, you want to get up, if you want to get up early in the morning, uh, if you want to get up early in the morning, you can see Jupiter and Venus really bright in the sky just before, before dawn. Um. Uh, next week, Fraser, um, I will reposition the scope and move it up a hill and see if I can get Saturn for people. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, oh, Teal, you've got the moon? Do it. That would be fantastic. Since the yeah, sun it is might so take boring. a second to find it. Yeah, that would be... Yeah, my tracking is going to be a little bit out, seeing as I only have the sun to align on at the moment, but I'll see what I can do. That would be really cool. Um, okay, great. Well, there you go. So maybe we will get the moon in the daytime. Um, all right. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions. Um, and so, like as you said, you know, we're glad to take requests. So if anybody has uh, any requests of objects they want to see tonight, we're happy to. If they're up right now, what what regions, Scott? If you've got Stellarium running, what regions are we sort of able to mostly focus in on this week? Well, I mean, we were looking at a lot on Cygnus, and I'll screen share this over real quick. So Cygnus the Swan is going to be right here. 
making sure that's popping up on my screen. So, I mean, we have Vega right there, Lyra. And so here's Cygnus the Swan, and we can just move all around. This is mainly what we're going to be seeing here in the Northern Hemisphere. We have Hercules, so we'll be able to see the great cluster of Hercules as well. Working on it. Oh, good. <laughs> what a guy, yeah. Stuart. Read yeah. behind. And there's the Summer Triangle, which, you know, should be the constellation, well, the asterism that everybody is aware of. So if you go outside, you should be able to all find the, uh, the Summer Triangle. And I love that even Stellarium kind of shows out. I mean, these are really bright stars. So no matter where you're at, even if you are in a heavily light-polluted area, you will still be able to see those. Yeah, I was going to say, even from downtown Phoenix, it's pretty easy to pick up the Summer Triangle, and that's probably, I think the only place that's got more light pollution than downtown Phoenix is probably, what, lower Manhattan? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and we're supposed to be the state with the best night skies, and yeah, we'll, we'll save that conversation for another time, but uh, I, I came out that the Summer Triangle is visible from, from downtown Phoenix, so it, pretty much visible anywhere. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, what have you got now, Gary? Well, I was trying to get the Cloud Nebula. And this bright star right here is Antares. And the Cloud Nebula is somewhat around Antares, and it's down in this area. Uh, I'm just getting so much light from uh, Antares. See if I start stretching it, you can start to see the nebula here. Hmm. But I'm just getting too much from... Uh, Antares is just blowing the whole picture out. And like I say, I'm trying to find new ones for you. <laughs> uh, so I've got a question here. Someone tried to view uh, M101 last night. Uh, is, this a diff is this a hard object to view? Were they using a, using a camera or were they trying to see it with their eye? Probably with their eye. Then it can be very difficult to see. It would be just a little kind of a fuzz. Um, and it depends on the size of the scope, of course but it, it can be very hard to see. Yeah. That's kind of the same thing with M13, like we were talking about in uh, last week's uh, star party, is M13 is right at the visible, the, the limit of the eyes, so you need some pretty decent skies to, to see it. So I, I guess maybe they'll comment again later in their comment thread if they were trying to use a telescope, a camera, or their eyes. Is that a cloud, Gary? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting the bubble nebula, but I've got a cloud in it. I'm looking... Uh, from me, I'm looking to the northeast, and uh, this time of year when the monsoons hit Arizona, that's where <laughs> clouds come from. Speaking of monsoons, I think you've got to share this picture, Ray, that you had. So, can you give us tell us what you what you just saw, Ray? Yeah, sure. I'll be I'll be more than happy to share why I'm not out in my <laughs> observatory. Um, for those who don't know, um, like like was previously mentioned a few minutes ago, um, despite all the the preconceptions, uh, Arizona is not a sunny paradise. You know, every day out of the year, uh, we actually during the summer have a monsoon season where we get a lot of uh, dust storms, thunderstorms, um, a lot of uh, less than pleasant weather, and um, I'm going to bring up a picture here real quick for everybody, and you'll be able to see this kind of rolled through our neighborhood earlier today, and there it is. Whoa. So basically, you know, we've got a, a 5,000 foot high wall of dirt that just kind of creeps along like something that you'd see out of like a movie. You know, it's just all bright and sunny, and the next thing you know, whoosh. And, so someone uh, bought a really nice telescope, didn't they? That somebody, nice. <laughs> yes. Actually, you know what it is? No, wait a minute, Fraser. I know exactly what it is. We need to call up uh, Ian O'Neill and yeah. complain because Discovery Channel Telescope just went online this weekend. They did, that's right. But, I was yeah. just tweeting them, actually, and we got had... back from the desert. And, <laughs> like, come on, fess up. What did you yeah. do? This is this is it. This is the clouds <laughs> coming after him, yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, I'll get, uh, we should get Ian. We should see what we can do to get the Discovery Channel Telescope participating. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, good. So, we're starting to get some, some views. So, John, what have, what have you got? I'm, I'm sort of just seeing a bright star here that's moving. Uh, Fraser, are you seeing my M13 while you're oh, going to Yeah, jump? I'm trying oh. to get alignment again. Here. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, there we go. That looks great. Yeah, it's, it's still very bright in the sky. It, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, give actually, me another few minutes. So now you're using the presentation mode on the backyard EOS, though, right? So there's no way to actually, oh, Teal's view, look at that. There's no way to embiggen it, right? 
Um, not in this view, but I can in a in a different using a different program. I will do right, that. Right. Okay. In a okay. Yeah. So why don't you go and like queue those up, and then we can just switch over to them. And then when I see them sure. in your in your screen, I'll I'll switch over. We can talk okay. about them. That looks great, though. It's going to be, but it's just still very bright in your sky. It's funny. Teal, nicely done. Okay, I've got a um, sixty second of the bubble, and the clouds have partially passed. Oh, there you go. So this oh. is the. All right, I'll let right Teal here. get a little more stable here. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so this is the moon in the daytime from Australia, which I think is really cool. And it's also right near a new moon, too. So that's, that's awesome. And that's one of the things that, you know, to kind of bring a little bit of science, a lot of people don't realize the fact that, you know, you can actually spot stuff like, you know, Jupiter and Venus and the new moon in broad daylight. If you know where to look in the sky, um, usually it helps if you have a pair of binoculars. Don't do it if it's too close to the sun. You might accidentally, you know, fry your retina by looking at the sun with your binoculars. But if you stand um, kind of in a, a shaded area and look, uh, the, the problem with our eyes is they've got, uh, our brain's got built-in image processing that tries to filter out noise. So a lot of the time, our brain will be tricked into thinking that Venus or Jupiter is noise, and it'll try and process it out. Of, of what we're seeing. So sometimes you use binoculars, you'll look at it, you'll spot it, and then you take the binoculars away, and you'll see a little pinpoint of light in the sky. So it's actually really cool and, and something that blows people's minds away when, when I show it to them, like uh, during daytime events. That's where the goal, and there's the clouds. All right. So, okay, Gary, this is great. That looks really beautiful now with the uh, uh, Nexus to Eden. Yes, I did say in Biggin, in that it embiggins us all. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Um, give it a little more nebulosity there. Oh, that's really nice. Wow, that's cool. But that's the bubble that's right there. Looks like the yin and the yang thing. <laughs> it, it Ray, can you dig up like a color it. image of that as well to give people some context? And where is this located, Scott? With the soap bubble? Yeah. No, this, this can is, be over. This is uh, Caldwell 11. Caldwell 11. The bubble nebula. It's. Um, it oh, is oh, oh, look at that. And uh, almost between Cassiopeia and Cygnus. And I know I said that wrong. Colwell 11 should be able to find it. Um, but so Stu yeah, I'm working on it right now. So yeah, so Stuart, uh, while, while we're looking for that stuff, let's just look at this uh, M13. I'm, my attention deficit disorder is, it's is running, it's running pretty fierce tonight. So <laughs> um, uh, that's beautiful. Look at that. That's great. So this is M13. So this is the uh, the great globular cluster in Hercules, and uh, one of the nicest objects that you can look at, both with binoculars, with a telescope, with uh, can't, uh, can you can almost see it with the un, with the unaided eye actually on really dark skies. It's like a fuzzy bit up in the sky. Just beautiful. So speaking of beautiful, surprisingly enough, the image that I just pulled up of uh, NGC 7635 looks surprisingly similar yeah. to uh, Gary's image. Yeah, it really does. Um, so, so for those that are wondering what this is, it's um, another emission nebula. Um, there's basically a stellar wind that's being pushed out from a very bright, hot star in the center of it. And um, there's also... Uh, where you're getting a lot of the glowing gas from is from a, a molecular cloud, uh, which is just um, H2, you know, molecular hydrogen, um, that gets excited. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, looking at some of the information on this, this is one that I wasn't familiar with. We're getting a lot of new stuff that, that Gary's pulling up. Uh, this one was discovered by uh, William Herschel. So kind of uh, yet another great discovery. Um, if anyone is wondering who the hell is William Herschel, he's the guy who discovered Uranus. And I had to really refrain from making a joke out of that. So, <laughs> um, so there you go. So that was a nice comparison. So that was good. So you can see the image was clearly rotated. Um, we've had one request, which we usually get every week, um, on the gear rundown. So why doesn't everybody tell us what their gear is? So we'll start with Gary. Gary, what have you got? Um, okay, I've got a, a Celestron. 14 inch. Oh, I didn't bring the window up. Um, Celestron 14 inch with a, a QSI camera. I'll, I'll bring a window up and you can see it in action sure. here. I've got it John, what have you got there? there? I've got a Celestron C8, which is an 8 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And the camera that I'm using is actually a security camera, camera called a Samsung uh, SCB2000. 
Now, do you do all of your astrophotography with that camera? Do you have a DSLR that you use? No, I don't have a DSLR, but I do have a, um, another dedicated CCD, more of an entry level. Uh, actually, I have a couple different ones, but it's uh, a Mead DSI Imager 2. It's a color one shot. We should yeah, try, no you DSI should try, view. instead of doing, I mean, this is great for the live view when, when we're doing the, like, the moon and Saturn and things like that, but you might want to try the, the Mead for doing the, the, the stuff that requires a certain amount of exposure time. And they just, you know, present the images. So we should we should experiment offline. I don't want to. <laughs> sure. um, but uh, oh, this is cool. So there's Ray's. This is your telescope, Ray. Yeah, that's my uh, eight-inch uh, reflector with my uh, guide scope camera on top. And of course, being the Star Wars nut that I am, was looking for a piece of flair for it. And actually, yeah, Hello Kitty Stormtrooper. I know. Laugh at me all you want, but it gives my scope character. And if anybody ever steals that thing, I guarantee you I'll be able to find it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, and Stuart, what have you got? Um, I have a Telescope Engineering Corporation um, refractor. It's a 140 millimeter uh, refractor. And my camera is a modified Canon uh, T1i. Uh, modified by uh, Gary Hannes, and I'm, it has a um, light pollution filter, clip filter on the on the front of it. And uh, Teal, what have you got? Yeah, I've got a, an 8-inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, so it's a Celestron mono again, but mine's on the fork mount, so it's a CPC 800, and the camera I'm using is just a stock standard uh, Canon 600D, so that's the, the T3i, I think. Yeah. So there's uh, two T3Is. So the, the, Canon, the Canon cameras, actually, we're finding a lot of the people here are actually starting to switch to those for doing the, the, uh, the imaging, and it's pretty neat. There's some pretty cool software that we're able to use for this. So, um, yeah. Okay, okay, I got mine up, Fraser. I was going to say, at some point in time, uh, yeah. somebody's got to tell me more about this clip-on light pollution filter because I would love to learn more about those being about, you know, 50 miles away from Phoenix, my views to the west are worthless. Yeah, I would love to know how to put a light pollution filter on my DSLR. Yeah, we can talk about it offline. But okay, that's fine. It's, yeah. it's really easy. I, I'll, yeah, I'll, send you, I'll, send, I'll send you the link. Well, why don't you tell us what you've got as well while you're here, Stuart? Um, this is the uh, Ring Nebula. Um, it is uh, a planetary nebula that is in the constellation of Lyra, and it's still a little light out, so um, uh, I'm just seeing, you're, you're, we're seeing a lot of blue still, but it's, um, uh, it's a sphere, but you're looking at this sphere um, in sort of two dimensions. Um, one sec. And um, I just took an, a, a, longer, uh, a longer picture of it now, which I'm going to flip to in a second. Looks great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, the ring nebula is one of my favorite, my favorite, favorite objects. Um, oh, Gary, you still got your your telescope up? If you want to switch to another. Yeah, I want to show it, and I'm going to reposition a little bit. So I okay. thought I would uh, reposition and just let you see it move. So there you go. So there's the ring nebula as sort of I don't know, taken by a big, long, fancy exposure. Uh, here's where it's located. You can see here's the uh, the summer triangle there. And uh, there's Vega, the constellation of Lyra. And right in between those two stars on, uh, on Lyra is, uh, is the Ring Nebula. So very easy to find. Oh, and there it is in Stellarium. <laughs> um, so we've got a question from Ron Bask. Gary uses a hydrogen alpha filter. The online store offers a hydrogen beta filter or a UHC filter for visual use. Would these be helpful for red zone viewing with an 80 mil millimeter telescope? Did that question make any sense to anybody? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it did to me too, beta. but go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. I don't know much about the hydrogen beta. I know for what I'm doing, there's not a lot of light in that range. Well, um, let me turn off the... Uh, the Ring Nebula. So basically, uh, if I understand what they're asking, they're not really asking about finding, uh, being able to see um, hydrogen um, in nebulas. Uh, from what my understanding is, when they're referencing a red zone, it might be uh, as far as light pollution. Uh, so they're basically asking, is this going to work in a heavily light polluted area? 
Um, if that's the, the question that they're asking, uh, certainly, because any filter, when you, when you put a, a filter on a telescope, it's only going to allow certain wavelengths to go through. So if you put you know, a hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta filter on a telescope, it's only going to let that light come through. Um, I mean, you're still going to get some diminished um, views you know, just from, from the light pollution. But um, you know, whatever you're looking at, so like if you get like an oxygen, like an O3 filter, um, you can do those. I mean, with some people, they'll take an H-alpha filter, and even in a moderately light-polluted area, you can put it right up to your eye and look around and see nebulas that are ordinarily not visible to the naked eye uh, just because you're basically using that filter in front of your eye. So um, I, I do think in, in a certain um, ability, um, and then um, I'm not sure on the UHC filter. The UHC filter, I'd have to double-check. I'm, I'm not familiar on that one. But uh, a lot of people use what's called a light pollution filter, and that's basically just uh, designed to filter out um, the, the high-pressure sodium lights, the, the yellowish-orange lights that you see in a lot of parking lots. That's what those ones are designed primarily to filter out. So what have you got now, Gary? This is the Cave Nebula, uh, very close to the last one we were looking at. I also had the heart and soul on my list, but they're behind a mountain for me right now, so we're going to miss them this week. But this is the Cave Nebula. Um, I don't have any other designation for it. Hmm. I believe that's Caldwell 9. Is it 9? I believe so. And Cepheus? There, there's my full field of view. It's beautiful. Uh, Brian uh, Lefkowitz asked, asked if uh, Andromeda is visible. It's not visible right now. Um, you can see it's it's very I think it's very low on the horizon, but it might have already gone down. Uh, that's the kind of object we were seeing in the winter time and fall. Yeah, I was gonna say, give us a few more months, and um, I, I'd have to actually plot it out. Hey, Scott, you've got um, Stellarium up. You should be yeah, able where's to. Yeah, where's Andromeda right now? Where's that? Fast forward it and tell us when everybody can expect to see it at well, uh, can, nine thirty at night. Well, he should be able I to see it. He <laughs> that's complicated, but he should be able to see where it is right now. No, not really. Well, yeah, because I can remove the ground, because that is awesome. So there's Andromeda right there. Here's the horizon where I'm at, over here in California. So Andromeda is right down there. So it's right at the horizon. Right. Yeah. And so it just went down is the problem. So if we had started this star party three hours ago, it would have been higher up, but it was also daytime. So there's Actually, if you have one of these this nice little star wheel, it's actually a lot quicker and easier. This is, this is trying to be like the old guy astronomer who says, I can do anything with a slide rule that you can do with your fancy computer. But actually, with one of these, you can actually dial it in, and you can find out exactly when, uh, at 9 at night, that uh, Andromeda will be visible in the night sky. But uh, I always keep one of these on hand because, yep. well, sometimes... It's a little quicker and easier to pull up than Stellarium. Don't don't get me wrong. I love Stellarium. I love uh, CART to CL. But uh, sometimes this little thing right here, when you've got a red flashlight in your mouth, can come in really handy. So, John, uh, what have you got for us here? This is the Lagoon Nebula. This is M8. And I think it was pretty interesting that this is one of the only other... Uh, star-forming regions visible with the naked eye from a dark sky, M42, the Orion Nebula, the and the other one. So if you had a good enough uh, sky towards your, your south right now, because that's riding between uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius, actually I think it's in Sagittarius, uh, you'd be able to see that. So uh, we've had a request for T. Lyra, which I guess is a star in uh, in Lyra. Yeah, it's a carbon star. It's a carbon star. Yeah. So does does anyone want to try and get a shot of that? I could certainly try. I'm not sure how well the color will come out for us. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can pull it up here in Stellarium real quick. And while you guys are doing that, I did pull up real quick on my um, uh, on the little star wheel and October. So depending on 
where the different October. telescopes are in, in the Hangouts that show up. But uh, in October, we'll start being able to pull up maybe a little earlier than that if people want to get dangerous and try and image something that's like just above the horizon. But to get it up above two air masses where the, the CCDs and everything will start to image it halfway decently, yeah. you're looking at uh, in, in October that it'll start Yeah, And so we're that, typically that getting it in, I remember us you know, getting it in November, December of last year was when we really started to get nice images of Andromeda. So. Yeah, and that would be when it's closer to being at uh, Meridian. Yeah. What's Meridian? <laughs> Great, throwing out jargon. Uh, basically, uh, astronomers speak for directly up above, um, above head. And uh, we were talking, um, I believe, uh, last week about uh, air mass and everything. So when you're imaging objects, you want them to be kind of as close to uh, straight above you as possible, because then you're looking through the least amount of air. And um, not really so much fighting the effects of the atmosphere. Yeah. Oh, Brian uh, Lefkowitz uh, just mentioned that he really liked the Google Plus commercial, which I think is uh, was cool. Felt like he hangs with us. So thanks, Brian. That was awesome. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen it yet, uh, Google has actually created a documentary about these star parties that we do. So if you do a Google search for virtual star party, you can find it, and uh, it's pretty cool. I'll put I the link in our post. Are you seeing the dumbbell there, Fraser? Yes, I am. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, no, I hadn't forgotten. Just so many things to talk about. Um, uh, that's beautiful. What's the Dumbbell Nebula? Anyone? Ray? Ray? You're, you're our astronomer, scientist. Everybody's jumping on me. Everybody's jumping on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm popular tonight. It's a, it's a planetary nebula. It's about yeah. 1,350 light years away from us. It's in um, Volpecula, I believe. It's one of those is actually yeah. you can you can see it with binoculars. It's beautiful, absolutely gorgeous nebula. Yeah, you can and, really see uh, the I colors. Look at the reds and the blues and the greens in it. I think we were talking about this in the last um, star party that I had mentioned that this is a Messier object. So one of those objects that Charles Messier was, you know, shaking his fist at that it wasn't uh, an actual comet. So, but yeah, planetary nebula somewhere in that mess is probably a small little white dwarf taking a trillion years to cool down. And um, like a lot of other people were saying, uh, with its, uh, with how bright it is, it's just, uh, it's another one of those ones that I think is actually just past the ability to see with the naked eye, but with binoculars, um, you're, you're, it's easy to find. Oh, somebody's uh, slewing a telescope. <laughs> I've got, qu got a question for the difference between uh, the meridian and the zenith. Oh, zenith is right below you. So basically, that's straight down is zenith, and meridian is straight above. Are you, are you sure about that? Zenith? Look it up on Solarium. The, then straight the, down, it's zenith. The, no, zenith is straight up. Uh, the meridian is if you're to draw a line between the north and the south, and it's the straight, up, straight over line, so the meridian goes through the zenith. The nadir is straight down. The nadir is straight down. Oh, right. It's getting late. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it happens. What have you got there, Gary? Well, I'm trying to pull out um, IC 4604, the, uh, 4603, and it is right here, but it's low enough, and I'm picking up some clouds in the edge, so yeah. I'm not getting it. So I'm going to go to some things that show up better. What about um, uh, M51? How is it? How far is it for you? M51 should be available. And if not, uh, or if Stuart can, it's such a I, crowd pleaser. I, I can get M51. I'm getting oh, T Lira right now. Oh, are you? Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. We have to fulfill the requests, of course. Love the requests. Yeah, please I know. Ask for stuff. Yeah, please ask for stuff, <laughs> so we don't have to think of what to do. You know, what's hilarious, I don't know, Scott, can you go back to your Stellarium for a second? Yeah. Um, and uh, crank up the, uh, the number, the object density. Do you know how to do that? So if you go on the left-hand side and you go to the configuration and then you go into the, um, the tool. Actually, you know, it's Skyrim. Oh, maybe it's not there. It's in, there's one where you can show, like, the, the, how many of the objects you show. 
Yeah, on the left-hand menu, it's uh, the third one down, sky and viewing options. Yeah, and you pull there that you go. one up, and then yeah. there's and then um, turn on the nebulas, and then you know there you go, keep going. You know, turn on the nebulas, but move the density. <laughs> 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 but go to the nebulas, yeah. Now turn the star so back down. Here's all the things. Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> all the things <laughs> that we can look at. <laughs> so, but turn the stars back down, right? So just right. Put, keep the stars at the bright stars. And but keep the nebulas up. So, so w these are the things that we could look at, like move around the sky. You know, there's parts where they're so. Oh, I'm gonna mute you, Stuart. Sorry. Yeah. Got okay. him. Good. Um, yeah. So you can see here. I'm sure at this point, uh, uh, Scott's uh, computer is grinding to a halt right now. <laughs> but, oh, I've got uh, a nice graphics card. This is oh, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say. Scott, yeah. how many frames per second are you getting on the little on the yeah. little FPS meter down there? Still, I'm getting about beautiful. 28. Okay, Stellarium is beautiful and smooth until you start to crank this much energy in, information into it. So anyway, so you can really see um, there's a ton of stuff to see, and so we don't even in each one of these, you know, what is NGC 7027? I have no idea. Let's take a look. What is you know? And so it's it's funny because. I mean, you would think with the amount of time that Gary has spent, for example, imaging these objects in the sky, you would think that he would be like, oh, yeah, I know this and I know that. But a lot of the times, every week, he's got a list of things that he's never seen before, and he, we don't know what we're going to see. So, so we have to sort of balance between the tried and true stuff and these. Like last week, we had this propeller nebula, and it was beautiful. It was one of the nicest objects that you've even shown us. And, uh, in fact, I want to go back there, if we can, Gary. Um, sure. At some sure. point, uh, because it looked just looked beautiful, and yet it was completely unexpected. You had never seen it. Um, oh, the coat hanger asterism. I love that. Can someone do the coat hanger? That would be awesome. John, uh, can you do the coat hanger? That might be a Gary one because it's it's really big. It's, it's pretty uh, um, big. It's big. Yeah. It's a uh, um, it's more binocular rather than telescope. Yeah, it looks like a little coat hanger upside down in your binoculars. It's amazing. Yeah, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll try the coat hanger in a second if it's if it's up. But right now, this is M51, and it's looking great, Gary. Yeah, that's the... Um, it's pretty low in the sky second. right now, too. Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. It, it's up a ways. Um, that's a 60-second shot. I'm uh, halfway through a two-minute exposure right now. We'll get a little bit more detail on it. And so, <laughs> yeah, nice shot, Ray. I like that picture you just took. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. jealous. Hey, I, I'm, I'm good like that through all the uh, <laughs> dust and clouds and, and everything. I've been managing yeah. to get that. No, I uh, I wanted to pull this up real quick for those who might not know about the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's uh, there's there's some error bars on the distance between 20 and 30 million light years away, and that's another one of those objects discovered by uh, Charles Messier. You know, shaking his fist at you know, gosh darn it, this isn't a um, a comet, and um, there's a lot of people who think that there might be a supermassive black hole at the center of it. And so, so uh, you can see Scott's showing uh, the region in uh, just underneath the, the handle of the Big Dipper there, where it is, just below Alcade. Right. Um, well, don't they think that all galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center? Um, yes, cool. I believe so. Yeah, I like that. And so, and uh, Stuart is is fulfilling the uh, the request, the T Lira. So, oh no, you brought up M fifty one. I think we missed the T Lira then. No. I'll go back to it one sec. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm still that's here's my M fifty one before I before it oh, goes away, so you can sure. See. Let's oh, let's great. just take a look at this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you can see the difference mine between mine and Gary's. So I've got a much smaller scope than he does. Yeah. And so it's you know much dimmer. Yeah. You also oh. see smaller. I love smaller the clouds going in front of the moon for teal. It looks really nice. What's that line across the bottom there, Gary? Is that an airplane? That's an airplane. Yeah. yeah. I went through my two minute right there. <laughs> well, the two minute looks really nice, and oh, that airplane is really cool. There we go. Here's Tealera before I go away. There you go. Oh, it's nice. It's a nice shot. How come it's it's less blue? Were you doing some color correction here? Um, maybe. Uh, well, it it's we're we're going through a modified camera with a um you know with my light pollution filter, so there may be some 
you know, being color being messed up a little bit in it. Right. So, I, I'm, I was going to go to Alberio next, and so we can sure. take a look at that. Cool, Gary. If we could go to the propeller next, that would be great. Okay. Um, what else? Boy, all these questions. Hold on. Uh, so Brian Lefkowitz mentioned the ISS time lapse. Yeah, there's a beautiful on Vimeo. There's a beautiful time lapse on on ISS. I, people are getting really, really good at that. Um, in fact, the the first one of these. You remember, like about a year ago, actually, on Google Plus. Uh, I posted a, a time lapse of the uh, of the ISS over the Earth, and uh, and now people have just and people have been posting just amazing uh, time lapses now. So what happens is on the International Space Station they have a bunch of cameras that are set observing the Earth, and they take pictures at very set increments. And then all this data is available on servers at NASA, and anybody who wants can go on there and produce their own time lapse images. And or the time lapse um, videos, and so people are doing just some amazing ones and putting it to music and different perspectives and lots of tricks, and they they're just getting better and better all the time. Uh, somebody wants M fifty seven. Oh wait, I just did that one. Uh, uh, yeah, you did. No, you did M fifty. Was that uh, the dumbbell? M fifty seven. I I get confused between M fifty seven and M twenty seven. It's either the dumbbell or the ring. I can't remember which. Um. So, yeah, that's yeah. We did the Ring Nebula. Sorry. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I can show my picture again yeah, if you like. Yeah, that's the Ring Nebula. Sure. Yeah, I want you to the picture you took. Yeah. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, Paul uh, wants to know how do you do a two-minute exposure without getting any movement in it? Does the telescope move with it? Uh, yes. Uh, the mount tracks, and then um, with two minutes, I can do tracking without any specific guiding. Uh, the mount is accurate enough that it'll follow and track. If I do longer five or ten minute exposures, I turn on my guide scope that I uh, lock onto a star and it keeps moving the scope to stay in, in the field. Oh, here's, here's rather nice of Alberio. You can actually see it sort of blue and, and gold a bit. Yeah. See oh, that? that's wonderful. What's the story with Alberio? Why? It's a, it's a, it's a binary, right? Um, I think uh, Ray could probably uh, tell me the truth, but the, I think that they think it's an optical binary, where it's not a true binary, but one is, um, you know, it's, uh, they're just right next to each other uh, in the sky, but they're not right, they're not a, it's not a true binary system. Yeah, I can jump in on that real quick and uh, provide some information on that. So, basically, um, the, uh, there's a one star that uh, is actually a binary system, and then um, basically, um, I'm sorry, I've got some different information here. Um, actually, the information that I have is saying that we can't tell whether or not it's a physical or an optical binary. At, le at least all the information I have. That's why I was a little confused there when everybody was talking about it being an optical binary or not. I've always known it to be an actual binary, like two stars actually you know, orbiting around a, a center uh, a common center of mass, but um, there's some debate as to whether or not it, it really is a binary or if it's um, stars that are just kind of in the same field of view. There's a bunch of those. I mean, if they're really far apart from each other, you can't really get any sense of their of their sideways motion. Um, so we've got a couple more questions here. Um, uh, Scott Reed wanted to know, how has astronomy changed recently and how much we predict it will change in the next 10, 50, 100 years? So, you know, if you've listened to Astronomy Cast, which is this podcast that I do with Dr. Pamela Gay, you know, we say again and again that we are absolutely in the golden age of astronomy, and I think you're seeing it right now. Here we are on the Internet showing pictures of telescope from telescopes. It's, it's an amazing time. There's amazing technology, there's amazing infrastructure, there's amazing space satellites, there's more satellites going on in space right now. It's a, it's a wonderful time for astronomy. So we are in the golden age of astronomy. Uh, who knows how it's, how it's going to change in the future. Um, highly recommend listening to our podcast if you haven't already, which is, uh, which is really cool. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, NGC 457. Somebody requested NGC 457. Let me see where that is. Although I have Ray's favorite right now. Oh, do you? Epsilon Lyra. Ah, the double double. Where is the double double? In Lyra. <laughs> Epsilon. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't see the double. Which is the double and which is the double? 
one double there and one yeah. double there. So and oh, the whole okay. thing is a double. See, so right. this is a double star. This whole what you're seeing, and there's a double there and a double there. It just zoomed in. So let me just, let me zoom so, back out again. See, there. So basically, Fraser, in a in a small telescope or binoculars or even to the human eye, you would see that as just a binary, as just two stars. Yeah. But when you've got a good telescope and you are able to magnify that and drill in. And you've got good seeing too. Like uh, sometimes poor atmospheric conditions can kind of wreck um, and and blur out the the double double. But when you magnify them um, and magnify, let's try and find out how to turn that into a word. Um, embiggen. Embiggen is why is the one we well, use around these parts. Well, but no, <laughs> but that's embiggen. That's make something bigger. I'm talking about magnifying it, seeing it something distant, bigger. So right. I suppose we can say big in it. Yeah. But anyways, um, when when you're able, you know, like like we have here with Stuart, you're able to resolve those into the, the, the four stars. Can you do the one in uh, Mizar? Sure. Okay, I like that one. Um, so Mizar is, is uh, in the handle of the Big Dipper, and it's in the way, the way it works. You know, if you've got really good eyesight, you can break it up into a double star and if and then under a telescope it turns into another double double like this. Um, and you said uh, NGC 457? Yeah, where is that? Up <laughs> or down, depending on where you're at. <laughs> Which constellation is it in? It's uh, by Cassiopeia. Cassia. Yeah, Ca Cassiopeia. And that's actually the uh, owl cluster. Oh, okay. I think we've had that before. So that's 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 an open star cluster, kind of like uh, the base. Oh, not, not quite as many of them, and not quite as bright. But um, I'm going to try and pull up a, a big image of it here in a second. Here. That'll be Stuart's. Uh, that'll be Stuart's. Uh, what, bag, what, I think. What was it? I'm sorry. NGC. What now? 457. 457. All right. Let me write it. Sure. You take. You have. To, the requests are coming so fast. You got to write them down. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh no! Somebody just proposed making an astronomy drinking game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know what what people are going to do. I got to think what about all What you guys do at mind. Dragon Con is up to you. <laughs> That's well, next let's month. Just, <laughs> let's just have the people playing the home game take a shot every time I screw something up, and then that way what will happen is they'll drink and so I much think. they'll forget and just think it was a great show. And I say that, yeah. Um, so let's go. Let's go with what Gary's got here. There, there's kids watching, guys. Um, let's see what Gary's got here. Um, and this is the propeller nebula that we asked that for is, last week. And Gary, can you show? That is a sixty second. Can you show your the image that you did, the one that you posted to Google? There, if you were ready. <laughs> that is. Yeah. Look at that, though. That's beautiful. Completely yeah, I unexpected. took that through the hydrogen alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen three. And with all the red, you can tell that it's mostly hydrogen. Um, the hydrogen looked, uh, when I developed it, the hydrogen looked just about like this. The sulfur, I could just barely see an outline of the propeller here. And then the oxygen, I saw nothing, just the stars. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the image that you took a couple of days ago. But yeah, that was Friday it. night. Friday yeah. night I took that. And so this is a great example, right, of, of an object that Gary just had on his list. You saw the, all of the objects that Scott had. He just put that down on his list and, you know, it was like I've never seen it before. Let's take a look. And it, it's beautiful. I really like it. It's, one of, it's becoming one of my favorite objects. And I had never heard of it before last week. So, um, uh, Pac-Man Nebula, is that up? NGC 281. Harley Grady wants to see the Pac-Man Nebula. Didn't we pull that up last weekend? Uh, no. That should be up. Yeah, okay. Right, Gary, you want to make uh, NGC 281 happen? 281, huh? Okay. Yeah. So, Greg Dorace wonders, is it true that seeing Miser double was an ancient eye test for the Turkish army? I've heard that. I'm not sure whether that's real or apocryphal, but, uh, but that is a... You, if you have really good eyesight, you can just barely, under dark skies, make out the the break in Mizar. Whoa! I think that's Stuart's uh, eyes. There you go. All right. So that's where the object is in Cassiopeia. Oh, that that's where the um, that's the NGC 281. Okay. And I think Stuart's going to go for 457. Working on it. Yeah. Okay. 
Somebody wants to see the Cat's Eye Nebula. Hmm. Where's that? I need. We need more telescopes. <laughs> Come mm. on. Yes. <laughs> we need better well, weather. We can always use more. Better weather. Yeah, we have lots of telescopes. We just need better weather. For example, here's Teal's view of the moon. I, I like the discussion that we were having on uh, Google Plus earlier, Fraser. That we just need to all like, you know, maybe do a Kickstarter and put up our own space telescope. Our I hear that NASA's telescope, got a few. Yeah. NASA's got a few mirrors laying around that they're not using. Yep. Let's uh, let's just yep. uh, get some of those guys in Germany to make a carbon fiber tube for it and stick on a Canon camera. And yeah, uh, you think Perfect. we can get a Wi-Fi signal from uh, 50 miles up? Uh, uh, we can hook antenna. it up. To, you, we can hook it to the International Space Station. Um, so, uh, John, you've got. Uh, looks like you have the dumbbell. Yeah, I decided to put the dumbbell up after I had to do a, another alignment after the meridian flipped for me. I so see this Chris, is with uh, the Chris, scope. I see Chris Ridgway, one of our astronomers, is uh, is clouded out and so is watching. Sad. Uh, so what have you got there, Ray? Which picture is this of? That is the Pac-Man Nebula. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, there I it is. I pulled that up. I figured I'd pull that up while uh, people were talking about that. So um, NGC 281, obviously everybody calls it, you know, Pac-Man Nebula because it looks like it. And um, that's actually um, part of, if I understand correctly, part of our Milky Way galaxy, one of our spiral arms. Oh, really? Okay. Well, maybe you can, can you rotate yours to make it more Pac-Man-y, Gary? Um, probably. Let me get the 60 second here. Okay. Yeah, to, just, uh, just turn that CCD a little bit. No, yeah, just, just, yeah. Just go and just just rotate your camera. Just twist the telescope sideways. Yeah, <laughs> well, you can loosen up the, the scope rings, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just um, so right, no problem. A, a bunch of people have been asking us, Eli Mendez, and a bunch of people have been asking for planets. And unfortunately, uh, the only planet that's up right now is Saturn, and it's actually pretty low on the horizon. I believe behind a tree for Stuart. I don't know. Is it still behind a tree for you, Stuart? Even more so now. Yeah, so it's a pretty bad time right now for the planets, unfortunately. Uh, we and it's you know we've had amazing views of Mars. We had Mars at opposition, so it's at its closest point. We've had Saturn, we've had Jupiter and Venus bright and together all through the winter and all through the spring, and now unfortunately they're all moving into the sun. Jupiter and Venus are morning objects now. Uh, Mars is very low on the horizon. Saturn is moving that direction too. We had Pluto last week, though, so that was kind of cool. Yeah, although it took us uh, about like uh, what was it, like three or four hours to uh, after the after the hangout for everybody to like analyze the images. Yeah, yeah, we did and, find it though. And, uh, we posted the images on levels, Google yeah. Plus. Yeah, it was pretty good though. Um, so there's the Pac-Man Nebula. That totally looks like it. It does, and uh, you can see I'm in the area with some clouds. Um, I've got them hanging over the mountains, and uh, they're going I'm, through. We're and I'm striking you. out. I'm striking out with NGC 457. I'm getting black, so I'm either not sensitive enough, or um, mm, I'm pointed okay. to the wrong area. So I'll try. Try again. You can try a different a different object. Okay. Was oh, that 457? You said. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know yeah, what it is. 457. I, the owl. Yeah, the ET or the yeah. owl cluster. That's in. Uh, Cassiopeia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pointing to the right direction in the sky. I'm just not seeing anything that's coming up. Yeah, 457 is the owl cluster. Orion uh, so is asking about the Orion. That's going to be a few months until we... Yeah, so the Orion out. Nebula is a winter object. We see it in December. So, unfortunately, we had great views of it when we were first starting the Star Party. In fact, it was one of the first objects that we got a chance to really see live, but... Uh, we got to wait another six months or so before we can start to see it again. Yeah. Cool. We'll move to something else, Gary. You need some suggestions, don't you? Actually, I'm going to try 457 here right now. Okay. It's very, very near the Pac-Man, but it's closer to the horizon still, so I may get uh, a mountaintop or a cloud. <laughs> Well, you got a pretty wide, uh, a wide view. I'm just trying to think how big the object itself is. Oh, that's why I have black. I'm pointed at a tree. 
<laughs> I, I didn't look up. <laughs> you don't have a you don't have a tree removal filter. Oh no, no, <laughs> no. Okay, so what that is? That's the chlorophyll nebula. <laughs> the, the foliage occultation. Yeah. <laughs> I feel uh, better now. At least it's not. At least it's not my mouth. So the cat's eye is uh, NGC sixty five forty three. Sixty five forty three, huh? Yeah. What was the uh, four fifty seven that we were looking at here? That was the uh, that was the cluster. I think you've got it here. It's a yeah. it's a star cluster. It's gonna be right there. Yeah. Looks yeah. like I got a partial satellite going. Through yeah, you got it a there. satellite going through it. I'm going to center up M10 here for a moment. It's a globular cluster. In oh, I can see it coming in, yeah. And Teal, how's your weather there? Uh, I'm actually out having a look at it now. It's not looking too fantastic. It's probably about 80% cloud at the moment. Oh, wow. And definitely in front of our moon. <laughs> yeah, the, your, your view has just gone all gray. I've had that happen before where I've not been paying attention. I've been doing other stuff and my machines, my uh, rig's been imaging and then I look in my, my file folder and I see my images like starting to change color. So, so oh man, a bunch of questions here. Okay, so Stephen Jett wants to know when will be the next time to see Jupiter. Get up in the morning and you will see Jupiter. So, it's before, like, you know, before dawn, Jupiter's up. Mm -hmm. So for, for the virtual star parties, probably... First third of November is when we'll first start be able to see it in our VSPs. Is, is it coming yeah, back during, in the, during our? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, is it going to be coming back to nighttime then? Yeah, yeah right. In the, in the fall. November. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we're, so we're looking at still about another three four months before we start getting Jupiter in our uh, in the in the virtual star party. Now, but the other thing that we've got going, we've got a whole daytime crew or a morning crew. We've got uh, Ahmet in Turkey, and we've got uh, David and a few other people in the UK. The problem is is that for them, it's already daytime now. So Ahmet in Turkey, he's in, he's, you know, it's like uh, 10 in the morning for him or 9 in the morning for him. So, but when we move to like 5 o'clock and when, when it's dark in the middle of the winter and we start at like 5 o'clock, then it'll be five o'clock in the morning for him and still dark and so that's that's great so then we get both our stuff at night and Amit's bringing it getting bringing us a whole different part of the sky in the morning so so hopefully once the uh, the nights get longer then then we should have a completely different star party um, uh, so I think uh, someone asked for the sombrero galaxy and unfortunately the sombrero is uh, is really low to the horizon right now in fact for Virgo I think for Gary it's just like not reachable um, uh, Star Talk, you want to know what the vertical streak on the screen? That was a, a um, that's a satellite. Yeah. Um, so Kay Taylor wants to say, it would be cool to have some star parties that are daylight in the US. Uh, absolutely, that is definitely part of the plan. But the but the funny thing about this is that, you know, we've got people in Malaysia, we've got Teal in Australia, we've got. Um, uh, Ahmed is in Turkey. We've got some people in in England, so we can definitely do it. But I don't. We kind of don't have enough people yet, and so the irony is that all of the most of the astronomers that we have right now are in North America, and so that's why these things have to go so late. But I would definitely love to do it another time when we've got the Europeans and the Asians participating, and then it's at, at a more reasonable time for people in in North America. So, so if to any be, of you out uh, there have some people you want to. Yeah, that'll be great. Well, Peter yeah. Peter's in Australia, but he's got and he's he's going to try and get some local uh, some local stuff happening. So that's definitely part of the plan. Uh, you know, okay, uh, <laughs> Jonathan wants us to get some Hubble time. Uh, you know, we've got some telescopes that are going to be coming online that will I think blow your mind. So uh, it won't be the Hubble, but I think we're going to have some really amazing telescopes participating within the next couple of months. So um, don't worry. Uh, Chris says he'll be able to bring in Jupiter around the end of September, beginning of October. So that's when we'll start to see Jupiter again. Uh, I have a new one here. Uh, it's not very good yet. I'm going to do a longer exposure. This is M94. Um, this is a spiral galaxy. And one of the nearest beyond our local group of galaxies. Very cool. I'm going to take a longer exposure of it, see, what, see if I can pull something else out. What were you focused on, Gary? 
Uh, I was trying to get the uh, cat's eye, but it's just a little too small for my view, so I went over to the Owl Nebula. That looks nice. And that one's close. There's a 10-second. Let me give it Now, you've got a big gray box around it, though. Yeah, I know. i got to increase the size. How's that? That looks good. I'll try to get the cat's eye. Okay, and then uh, for those that are wondering uh, what was meant by uh, relatively close, you know, in our local neighborhood on M94, it's, you know, on the order of, you know, 16-ish, you know, give or take million light years away. So just throwing that one out there. Um, and I've... I'm sorry, go ahead. Just a trip down to the local chemist. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, space is big, you know, really big. <laughs> Gary, what's, uh, the, what's the de designation of cat's eye? Uh, 6543. That's what they said. I'm going to look that up again. Can you queue up the uh, the Triffid as well? Stuart, I know you've got a big list of, of stuff. Uh, I don't know, John, you want to get the Triffid? Yeah, 6543. Okay. Eli Mendez wants to know if live radio telescope would work. I don't know. Noisy astronomer would be a good person to find out. We should get Nicole to, to bring the radio telescope. Showing pictures of her on a boat. So, Nicole, <laughs> when you see this, I know you're on a boat with your flip-flops, but get back and hang out with us. Be cool. Yeah, bring a radio telescope. <laughs> There's actually some plans on the internet for taking like an old uh, dish or um, uh, like a dish network or any of those small little uh, satellite dishes and hooking them up with a meter and you can do like some little uh, backyard uh, radio astronomy. You can do it in, for like uh, school groups and stuff like that as a demonstration to kind of point it away and then point it at the sun and then point it away and have a little signal meter bounce. Um, it can even pick up uh, people, which is kind of interesting. I didn't know we radiated that radio, radio waves. waves. Yeah, exactly. Um, Gary, uh, were you going to move on to something else? I got this a request. Is, yeah, this is the owl. That's the owl nebula. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's a nice one of the other one. I was the the last spiral galaxy I was showing. You can kind of see the central nuclei. We're we're yeah. seeing you, Stuart. You are our central nuclei, though. Yeah, we, well, I'm, I'm red. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what is that? A, uh, an, a red M dwarf there? Uh, I can't yeah. tell. Enjoy this uh, view of the moon <laughs> while we wait. There. Is it there? Oh, is it there now? Uh, there it is. No, not yet. Okay. I was going to say, those clouds passing past the moon, it makes it kind of spooky. We should, like, try and come up with something for a Halloween special. It's, it's working, uh, Stuart, but it's a little fuzzy so far. It's still trying to uh, pull in the image. Hmm, okay. Um, I'm already away from it. This will be oh, the best. Oh, there it is. Okay. There it is. It's a much smaller object, isn't it? Yes, but it's bright, so you can see the it, you you don't really see the spiral arms that well in my view, but um, you can see the really nice central nuclei. It's really nice and bright with the the dust lanes on the outside. That is really cool. Okay, gonna try for the cat's eye now. Okay. And John, you had the Triffid before, right? I okay. had the lagoon. Yeah, the lagoon. Oh, okay, all right. You want me and to uh, switch it up to the Triffid? Yeah, and uh, Gary, what have you gone to? That looks like the Eagle. I just popped over to the Eagle. Can't resist going there. No, I was just going to ask you to go to the Eagle Nebula. That's funny. <laughs> uh, we're of one mind now. It's a really nice. Actually, it's nice that you're waiting to show this sort of by the end of the session because it's a lot crisper, getting a much better view now. It's a lot higher, right? right? Yeah, it's higher in the sky. Yeah, so so if anyone's um, uh, wondering, that is the uh, those are the pillars of creation there. So these are that famous Hubble Space tel Telescope, uh, which that's your cue, Ray. This is the, the that famous Hubble Space Telescope image of the uh, the pillars of creation. These are this active star forming region in the Eagle Nebula, and uh, you know 
couple of months ago, I didn't realize that we were able to see this live in the telescope, but there they are. Just beautiful. It's, um, also, the astronomy picture of the day is the uh, uh, Pillars of Creation. For when? And today? Yeah, for today. I've got Your my picture, this saved. picture right now? No, 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 no. The, oh, okay. The Hubble, <laughs> the Hubble's Pillar of Creation. Is, Which uh, is what I should have loading here in a second, and that's what I was working on when Fraser was like, yeah. hey, it's your cue, <laughs> kind of trying to pull up an image for everybody to look at, nice big, big image. I think that's and, the Triffid. Uh, yeah, I was pulling up the Triffid, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm trying to keep track of, we're, we kind of got <laughs> going at a free creation, and we've got right. like 20 different mm -hmm. things. Okay, so I'll pull up the, the it's, it got a little fast and frantic there, guys. Um, yeah, I can pull that up. I have the, uh, the Tennessee dark nebula blocking my view right now. Clouds are rolling in, so I'm oh. going to have to switch it to somewhere else. Okay, the dark nebula. Maybe for a bit here. The water nebula. Uh, Ryan Albertson wants to know how long it takes for the light to reach us from the Eagle Nebula. It's, what, about 8,000 light years away, I think? No. Now I'm just making stuff up. Don't listen to me. Um, I can tell you in just a second. Um, and Mr. Chestime just said, any takers to my question, but I don't see the original question. So if you could repost the question, yeah. maybe we can answer it. So on the Eagle Nebula, it's about uh, 7,000 light years away. So 7,000 years. There you go. And so the thought is that those, uh, those pillars have actually collapsed, that, they, that a supernova has, has explodified them away. Um, I have the cat's eye, but it's a blob. Yeah. That's a nice blob. It is tiny. I can see why Gary couldn't, uh, but couldn't it, get it. It looks like you didn't do a very long exposure on it, though, right? This looks like, what, 15 seconds? Uh, no, this, second. is, this is 60. Yeah. Um, I can do longer if you like. Yeah, no, it's okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, so there's the pillars. And let's go back to Gary. So you can see there... I'm getting a bit of an echo from someone. Where am I getting the echo from? Okay. Um, yeah, so you can see those are the those three objects there. This is the one to the left. This is the one you see in the middle, and this is the smaller one. Yeah. There, there. Of course, my image is reversed. Um, well, you're seeing your image. Oh, no, I guess you're seeing it. Yeah, okay. Never mind. Um, yeah, well, we we talk about this all the time, right? That all of the different objects are are flipped around, and and the the cameras. It all just depends on the the orientation of the camera and the location of the telescope and what hemisphere you're in and how your software is set up. So, you know, things will look in different. Because sometimes we've had images where there's like two versions of Saturn, and one is one way and one is the other way. There's no uh, rhyme or reason to it. Good. Well, I think we'll... So we've got a few more objects to queue up. We're kind of reaching the end of the time here, so why don't we start to, to wrap things up. Um, did anyone, Was anyone bringing up any more objects that people wanted to see? Uh, Triff is behind a tree for me, so I'm not going to be able to get that. And I know that John... Triff was behind a cloud for John. I'm Gary, you're, I, which is you're our only hope. I should be able to give you the Triffid. And no, and and Saturn is even worse, Stuart. Uh, even worse now, yes. Next next week I will um, uh, climb a hill and see if I can get internet connection, and I'll get you Saturn. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> we have a lot of people. That, you know, we should have. Someone's got to have a nice clear night sky. And there's the moon. I love that we're getting the moon in the daytime from. Uh, from Australia at the same time. But you definitely can't see the really subtle features on it. And there it goes. <laughs> That's it. This is this is Mother Nature telling us that it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> so, uh, um, cool. Well, there's... Uh, so the last image I think we'll show then is the uh, is the Triffid, and this is from Gary, and that's fantastic. Look at that. That's a 10-second exposure of the Triffid. That's only 10 seconds. Yeah, it's such a bright object. Fantastic. And wow. there's there's the image of Triffid that I accidentally pulled up earlier when I was trying to catch up with the flurry of objects that everybody was throwing their objects at. So you can see like uh, what Fraser was talking about earlier, 
that this image is in a slightly different orientation than uh, with Gary's telescope, but you can still recognize those lines in the center and kind of wow. you know, map the same features. You can see the difference in the gases. I'm showing the red area, but I don't show anything in the blue area. I need the other filters to show that. Right, and so typically yeah. you'll you'll go out and you'll switch your filters and and see different parts of the nebula to build up the full spectrum yeah. of the image. This yeah. one, you get the best picture with just a red, green, and a blue. Not trying to do narrow band, but here I can't really do that very well. All right, well I think we'll we'll close on this beautiful image of the Trifid Nebula. So thanks again, thanks Gary, thanks John, and thanks uh, and thanks Stuart and uh, Teal for for delivering us the telescope views this week. It's fantastic. We really appreciate it. And thanks to Ray and Scott, as always, for bringing the color commentary. And thanks to everybody who watched. I'm really glad we were able to get to a lot of your requests. And, uh, and hopefully, who knows what will happen next week. So oh, I think we should, should have a night moon, so that'll be good. But, uh, yeah, we'll see, you all. we'll see you all next week. Night, Bye. everybody. Good night. Good night, thanks, everybody. Bye, Good night. Bye,